My name is Trevor Tierney, and you're listening to Pro Lacrosse Talk. On Schreiber. Snyder with scores. Now in front, Pinnell scores. Hands off for Rabel, switches hands and scores. Kylie O'Miller showing off those shifty skills. Right off the bat, there's Lyle Thompson. That's a great offensive number. He's coming in with a left-handed shot, and look at the save by Tierney. Welcome to Pro Lacrosse Talk, the voice of Pro Lacrosse. I'm Hutton, he's Adam, together we're bringing you interviews with your favorite players and coaches as well as news from all four professional lacrosse leagues. Welcome to another episode of Pro Lacrosse Talk. I'm Hutton, he's Adam, and today we're joined by lacrosse great and former pro, Trevor Tierney. Trevor's lacrosse resume includes a laundry list of accolades, most notably being the only goalie to ever win a collegiate, professional, and world championship. Trevor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. So Trevor, let's start your early days. Your dad is obviously Hall of Famer Bill Tierney. Um, He's been a coach since you were born, having coaching stints at RIT, Hopkins, before landing at Princeton, where he kind of made a name for himself, and, uh, you know, now at Denver, where he most recently won a championship in 2015. Uh, Your sister, Brianne, is currently the women's head coach at Kent State, helped start that program. So what was it like growing up in a lacrosse household? Um, Well, yeah, the first thing is that I I would say that lacrosse, uh, the game of lacrosse has always been a huge part of all of our lives, and incredibly grateful to the game and um, all the great gifts and experiences that it, that has brought our entire family. Um, uh, growing up was really, it was a lot of fun for me as a kid getting to be around um, just great teams and great players. These were all my, all my role models uh, growing up were guys that I, that I got to know and be around um, as early as, you know, I remember as early as Hopkins, um, being around guys like Larry Quinn and Quinn Kessinich and Dave Petromala. Coach Petro actually babysat us a few times when we were young. <laughs> and, uh, and then we move on to Princeton and, um, you know, guys like Scott Bacigalupo and, and all the uh, great players there. So I, I was always, it always felt like I was surrounded by um, uh, great older brothers um, through all the teams my dad coached. And, uh, all, all of us, my mom and uh, my brother and two sisters, were are obviously um, incredibly proud of my father and, and all of his uh, great work that he, he's done in the game. That's terrific to have so many, you know, mentors at such a young age. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, I got to I would get done school and uh, go go straight to go straight to practices and, and hang out at practices and and travel with the teams on the bus and stuff like that. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun growing up. Uh, with the coach of the father for sure. Kind of let, let's talk about that decision, I guess, to to go down the road uh, to play for your dad at Princeton after having an awesome career at the Hun School. Was this kind of a no-brainer from the beginning, or or was this kind of did he have to sell you on on going to Princeton? Um, I you know I, I I was at a you know at that age in your life you you kind of want to see if um, if there's other opportunities for sure. sure. So I. Um, I visited North Carolina and Virginia and was also recruited by Hopkins in Maryland and really loved, uh, really loved both places. I, I, I love North Carolina so much that I called my mom on Saturday night of the recruiting trip and told her that not to tell dad that I, that I thought I would go to, uh, <laughs> go to Carolina. And then, um, yeah, weighed, weighed some of the other decisions and some of the other factors. And uh, honestly, you know, from a lot from that childhood experience of being around Princeton and mm-hmm. being around all, all those great guys that I was um, exposed to, um, I just loved the culture at Princeton sure. that, that my father and, and Dave Metz that are, had built over all those years that I wanted to be part of that, that tradition and that family and, and go to uh, – a great great school so um yeah just, just decided to to do it for for all those reasons and and was also grateful to, to have the chance to to spend four years uh, very close with with my father no that's great uh my grandfather actually attended the hun school um and then he attended one year at princeton end up going uh to Ryder to finish his college career and then my great-grandfather coached boxing at the hun school so um uh, my family is very embedded in the Princeton community. Um, they ended up moving to Baltimore, but uh, you know I definitely have some Princeton roots, so that's that's awesome to hear. Um, yeah, Hun Hun was uh, Hun was a great place. It wasn't quite as good at lacrosse as it is now. So I'm, <laughs> I'm proud of my, proud of my school, my high school. For uh, they've really grown, and it, it's a it's a tremendous program in their own right. No, that's awesome. And then you were lucky enough to find you know a lot of success when you were um, you know at Princeton. 
uh, you won the national championship your freshman year and then capped it off, uh, you know, winning uh, one in 2001 as a senior. Talk about the culture at Princeton and what made the program, you know, so successful. Yeah, when I mean, when I got there, um, the seniors that were there were, were guys like, you know, Jesse Hubbard, mm-hmm. John Hess, Chris Massey, um, that, that, that amazing group that had – uh, the, that that year, my freshman year, that was their third title in a row, um, mm-hmm. and that was a fifth in under ten years at Princeton. So there was kind of this um, tradition where it, it, if you wanted to, um, you know, really there was kind of this pressure on the senior class every year that if you wanted to leave your mark on the program, that you know it was kind of expected that you get to Final Fours and win national championships. So. Um, to be around those guys and see how hard they worked, you know, like I remember all three of those guys hitting the wall every day and shooting around and, and you know, really looking up to the way uh, they led our team when we were freshmen and then, and then wanting to do the same um, our senior year. So it was cool to kind of uh, bookend it because mm-hmm. the, the two years in between, we, we had a little bit of growing to do uh, Syracuse. Syracuse smashed us a few times in those mm-hmm. two years, and uh, we we had to grow as a team and, and work hard to get back to that spot that that those guys had had gotten the program to. Do. So um, yeah, it was a great great experience. I had great teammates there, great friends, and um, yeah, Princeton University is an amazing place to go. So um, I I look back on those years very very fondly. That's great. And uh, it was kind of a good time to graduate in 2001 with uh, Major League Lacrosse set, getting set to have their inaugural season. You were drafted second overall in the, the collegiate draft by the New Jersey Pride, um, right behind your Princeton teammate, Ryan Mott, which I'm sure was pretty cool. Talk about those early years um, in the MLL. Oh, man, it's funny. I remember... Um... <laughs> That night, that so there were Princeton reunions going on um, mm-hmm. that week for the draft. We, okay. we had just won a national championship, and uh, Dave, Dave Morrow uh, and 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 uh, the MLL sent like a limo to Princeton to pick us okay. up. To, I think it was in Baltimore, but the limo was like from it was like from 1973. <laughs> <laughs> so we all went down, and then. Uh, yeah, Malik got drafted first, and um, on the way home, the limo driver, like coming out of the parking lot, uh-huh. um, drove over a curb and just just broke broke this old limo like right in half, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I think of that. I, I always think of that night. But uh, Malik was obviously an amazing, uh, amazing defenseman, and, and mm-hmm. uh, he, he was a Ryan was a midfielder from boys Latin when he went, went to Princeton and then got converted to a defenseman and long stick maybe and could really, really do it all out there. Um, so yeah, like the, the MLL starting up the year before they had, they had kind of done the, um, the showcase kind yep. of like the PLL did this past year where they traveled around the country, had two teams. And, you know, you were talking about, all my heroes growing up, um, you know, think about the goalies back then that were in the league, like Doherty and Lacasio, yep. and then the Gates were playing, and um, you know, just you know, the Pals, all the all the greatest players in the world on two teams, and then uh, that year it was uh, grown, grown to six teams. So it was um, it was really exciting to just get to keep to just to. Uh, play the game at a high level after college and keep challenging yourself and um, and and it, it got better year in and year out and then my my last two years getting to play out in Denver because I, I I moved down here in 2001 okay so I was going back and forth to East Coast my first four years or so and then um, getting to play out in Denver at Mile High was just uh, an incredible experience to end my career so yeah the the MLL did. Uh, did a phenomenal job growing the game to a professional level. And, and you know, I'm really grateful to Dave Morrow um, and to the, to New Balance and to all those owners that, that really took a chance on professional lacrosse in those early years and, and, mm-hmm. and helped bring it to, I think, a, a higher level now. 
That's awesome. Yeah, we uh, we talked uh, to Mark Millen a few weeks ago, and I was I was telling him uh, I ha- I think I burned through five or six of those Warrior Exposure DVDs uh, that I rem- I would watch. I was a goalie, and I would watch you and Greg Catrano was in that, and uh, I, that that was a great uh, opportunity to kind of grow the league. And I had those uh, Warrior Superstar goalie gloves that you guys had in like two thousand and three too. So I burned through a lot of those back then. Those were those were cool things like custom gloves and, you know, <laughs> DVDs and, you know, those are things that hadn't been done in the game yeah. yet. And um, Dave, Dave Morrow and, and Jim Davis, the new bounce, they, they took a big risk to kind of, uh, yeah, bring, bring, bring it, some new professionalism to the, mm-hmm. to the game. So it was a huge, I think it was a huge step for, for the game um, sure. at, at that time. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you had quite a career. Uh, you spent your first few years with the Pride, and then you played in Boston for a year before landing with the Baltimore Bayhawks in 2005. Had a great year with them, um, made the All-Star Game, and ultimately won the Steinfeld Cup over the Lizards. Um, talk about that experience winning that, you know, with that historic squad. I mean, you had guys like Mikey Powell, Gary Gate, Tom Marichek. You know, what was it like winning that first championship for yourself? Yeah, it was so. It was such an incredible team. Um, you know, Gary Gary Gate that year was kind of like a player player coach, um, mm-hmm. kind of like Reggie Reggie Dunlop, you know, from mm-hmm. Slapshot. And uh, <laughs> and the, the team itself. I mean, like first of all, you had Paul Paul Potanza Bene winning yep. every face off, um, and then yeah, like Lee Zink w- w- um, was playing defense in front of me. Sean Natalin, uh, Brody Merrill. And um, yeah, just the the offensive talent on that team. I mean, there were there were guys like Josh Sims and Jeff Sankey that could get overlooked on that team mm-hmm. with, with with how stacked we were. <laughs> so, um, but it, it it's still it's like everyone talks about how great that that team was, and it it, it was it was a very good team. But it was it, it's not easy winning an MLL championship. <laughs> um, sure. So. Uh, you, you know the other teams that we, that we were facing. I, I think we had a really great game in the semifinals against the Rattlers, and then um, just played just played a really solid game uh, against the Lizards in that championship, and 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 really handled that game pretty easily. But um, to win an MLL championship is something uh, that I'm incredibly proud of, just because of how how hard it is and and the level of talent that you have to face, and so. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm incredibly grateful to be be part of that that 2005 Bayhawks team because I I think you could um you could put us up against anyone and and um and still to this day you know play play at the highest levels possible. So yeah, that was a that was an amazing experience. You know, absolutely. And then uh, you actually the following year you were part of what's believed to be the largest trade in professional sports history uh, with six teams and 24 players being involved. Uh, you found your way uh, to Denver on the Outlaws. Um, they were, you know, I think a, a new team then. Um, what was it like being part of that huge trade and then, you know, find yourself uh, heading out to Denver? Um, it was great, one, just because I, I was living out here. So yeah. I was just so excited to get to play in front of, you know, friends and family and knowing they were going to be playing at uh, what was – it was in Vesco Field at the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's undergone a few different name changes, <laughs> but Mile High Stadium and – um, the, the outlaws just the the way they handled um, Max Freeman, uh, the way the way he handled uh, just ha- having professional lacrosse team in town. It was they were just doing things that just just so many cool things like around town, having team get-togethers and um, really promoting the team well, and you know, and then drawing these huge crowds, having the, the fireworks night on mm-hmm. July fourth. Um, it, it was really cool to, to play to play the couple, my last couple of years there, and um, and then also be with friends like uh, like Jeff Sankey came out and Josh Sims and um, and Lee Zink was, was out here too, and, and we we just had a great time together. And the thing about that expansion was that um, a lot of the a lot of the teams back east were still really stacked and so the western teams we we didn't know how if we were going to be able to compete with those east coast teams at, at, at the time and um that that first outlaws year we we had a really great season and then uh lost uh believe in the championship to the to to um the barrage and who were just 
uh, incredible that year. But um, we we really we really clicked together that season. Like a kid like uh, Mike Law from at, that I played at DU also played on Team USA with me in 2002. Had an amazing year. So it was, it, it was a lot of fun. We got to travel and play in LA, you know, LA and San mm-hmm. Francisco. It was more fun than playing on the East Coast because of the the cities you get to go to Chicago. Um, so it was actually. Uh, the, the actual experience of playing and traveling was a lot more fun than than like going to Bridgeport and Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we we had a, we had a great time those two years. That's awesome. And you kind of talked a little bit about those 2002 World Games with Team USA. You guys had a obviously uh, an awesome tournament, culminating in that gold medal win against Canada, 18 to 15. Um, you were named to the all-world team. What was that experience like? Obviously, you played in 2006 as well with Team USA, but what was it like suiting up uh, for Team USA and bringing home the gold? Yeah, it was a it was a huge honor to to get get to play for your country. And um, you know, we were we were a really young team. A lot of the a lot of the MLL players either cho- chose not to or or were told not to play that year. So we were like. We were a very young uh, team, although we had some great uh, veterans um, like like uh, like Darren Lowe and Kevin Lowe with us, and um, we just cl- really clicked together. Some sometimes in you know a lot of times in sports, it's more about how a team comes together rather than just having a complete all all star cast. And Canada had all their had all their best players, so everyone mm-hmm. was back home saying, "Oh, USA is going to get." get crushed they're not they're not going to be able to win this world games and we went we went down to australia and really um found a way to play well together and um and 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 ended up um, winning you know winning the whole tournament and you know had two really great games uh against canada but they, they were they were they were stacked that year i think canada you know, after that year, and then and then we lost to them in 2006. They started to put some of those other pieces in place for for world championships, like mm-hmm. like a face face off guy, and um and but they always, they always had great goaltending and Chris Anderson. But they yep. just they started be, in in the early 2000s. They, Canadians really started to figure out how to play the game of the field game at a higher level. And, and I think a large part of that was due to the fact that a lot of them were playing uh, professional field lacrosse in the, in the summer. So, um, but, but that 2002 run was, uh, was, was a lot of fun. And again, I got to play with some, some great friends uh, mm-hmm. like, like Ryan Mollett um, from, from Princeton and, uh, and, and Mikey Powell was on that team. So I got to be with guys that, that I hadn't played with before, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it was a uh, very, very very fortunate to be a part of that team as well. I mean, all my all my championships, I, I look back and I, I just feel incredibly fortunate to be around the great teammates that I had for those uh, for those four championships. That's awesome. And if any fans out there want to go relive that O uh, two game, uh, it's actually on YouTube. I watched it yes last night. So uh, the full thing oh, wow. the full things on there. If you just if you just put in the two thousand two World Championships into YouTube, it pops right up. So if you wanted to watch and reminisce too, you more, you can find it. There. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't remember the game that well, so I might have to go watch it. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. And uh, going off of that a little bit, you know, we talked about you know your pro career. We talked about you know your world career. Um, what's kind of your thoughts now, though, on the pro game where it is now? Obviously, we have two competing leagues in the PLL and the MLL. Um, what have you kind of seen from pro lacrosse uh, that kind of excites you from either league? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as far as the PLL is concerned, I think Paul has done, uh, Paul Rabel has done an amazing job of bringing bringing the marketing to the next level for for all the players and. Um, you know they're they're doing an in, incredible job of uh, of of pumping the teams and pumping the players and using social media as you know a way to to, to promote the game and get it in front of people and then doing things like you know bringing bringing in the barstool sports guys and and so like it, it starts to reach into different worlds where people you know may not have known uh, uh, about the game and are are learning about it and and hopefully that you know brings brings new fans to the game and and um 
and, and brings the professional game to to a new level. Um, it's unfor- I, I feel sad that the the, the MLL had had to take such a had to take such a hit with all the mm-hmm. with all the talent leaving um, because of all the hard work that that the earlier uh, people put in and also all the you know all of us um, MLL athletes over the years you know we 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 sacrificed a, a lot of time and long summers and mm-hmm. you know didn't get paid up paid a lot to um, a lot of injuries you know so I just hope that all those guys are. Um, you know, remembered well for for their efforts and the sacrifices they made to to start off. You know, the, the, those original MLO guys. You know, mm-hmm. that first year they 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 really started it off. So, I hope I hope in the next couple of years that we see some sort of uh, melding of the of the two leagues. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that's not really up for me to decide. Um, but um, and, and like I was saying before, I, I'm also grateful for all the original MLL owners and, and founders that, that, you know, Jim, Jim Davis and Dave Morrow and Jake Steinfeld, they poured buckets of yep. their own money to start professional <laughs> lacrosse. Sure. So when we have these conversations, I, I just hope that it, it's kind of uh, the MLL is re- remembered as an evolution or a stepping stone as pro lacrosse. And also, you know, I, I I I, um, I think those guys now are are you know in the PLL are are doing an incredible job. So um, I, I'm very excited to see where where it goes in in the coming years. No, absolutely, we appreciate your thoughts on it. It's nice to hear you know perspective from a, a former pro. And you know, me and Adam, we cover both. We you know enjoyed watching the MLL when we grow up. We enjoyed what the PLL has been doing, and it's kind of cool too as fans. You know, it is, we do eventually hope there is more of a merger. That way, you know, you could all the talent in one league, but, uh, it's nice that we have, you know, twice as much lacrosse on now, um, you know, to watch. So, um, yeah, we appreciate your sentiments though. Yeah. It's incredible how much lacrosse we get to watch on TV now that it's a lot of, a lot of fun. Cause when, you know, when I was growing up, it was, you were lucky to get those, uh, final four games, yep. championship games on TV. So now to have two pro leagues and all the college games that are on that, that's the thing that, that excites me um, for new for new fans uh, getting to see the game. Yeah, that's great. And you know, yeah, you're talk, we're talking a little bit about the growth of the game here. So let's talk about um, what's considered one of the bigger moments in lacrosse for growth is when your dad um, made his way to Denver um, uh, to be their head coach, and and you ended up being an assistant with him, helping the defense and the goalies, and that squad ended up winning the national championship in 2015. Um, talk about uh, that experience joining your dad in Denver and uh, that 2015 squad. Yeah, I remember, um, like I said before, I've been out here yep. probably seven or eight years, and then um, I remember the, the, the DU job opened up and talking to my dad, and he was talking to the, the AD, um, Peg Bradley uh, Dobbs at the time, and mm-hmm. uh, she invited him out for a trip, and I, I remember before him coming, him just being like, well, I, I'm just you know, I'm going to help out them find a good coach and kind of advise them and like, okay, well, just come stay with me. And then, yeah. uh, you know, he hung out and, and I remember the look on his face the, when he came back to my, um, my place in Denver the first night and he's like, oh, wow, I really, really like this place. <laughs> and, uh, and then he had a really good meeting the next day. And uh, as he was going home, I, I knew I knew it was. I knew he was kind of leaning this way because he was. He was really starting to worry about telling his Princeton players about about this decision. Um, mm-hmm. He loved. He loved Princeton. He loved all the great, you know, players and teams that he got to work with there, and the current players that he had there. But you know, I think he was excited for a new challenge and a new chapter in his life. And sure. uh, my mom and him moving out here. So, yeah, we we you know we kind of started. It felt a lot like um, the the Princeton rebuild. It was it wasn't Princeton was a lot worse when my first when my dad first got there. Um, they were like the bottom of the barrel in the Ivy League, and there there were some good good players at DU when we when we first came on and um, made a good run to the playoffs in the first year, and then slowly built our way up. Had a couple tough final four losses and then you know really 
you know, that, that 2015 year had some really great talent with guys like Westberg and Canizeros and um, Tyler Pace and, you know, Ryan LaPlante had really grown in goals. So they were, they were a well, they were, they were a seasoned team. Um, and uh, I, I, I just, that class was such a special class to me. I remember mm-hmm. recruit, recruiting those guys early on. They were from all over the country. You know, we had guys from like, Diff, all different states that really you wouldn't expect a lacrosse team to win a national mm-hmm. championship with, like Minnesota and Tennessee and Indiana and California, all these, you know, random places. Yep. And um, and they were just a, a great group, you know, guys like Mike Reese and, and uh, you know, Berg and um, uh, just, just so many great guys from, mm-hmm. from all over the place. And they, mm-hmm. they had a – they had great chemistry together, and it was fun to watch them win that national championship together. That's awesome. And let's let's kind of move on and, and talk about some of your your current projects, um, kind of on a professional level. So you helped start Delta Developmental for for consulting college programs and organizations, and you fa- helped found and are running LXTC Lacrosse Training Center currently. So talk about some of those projects and what made you kind of transition to that side. Yeah. I, um, uh, in, in the uh, but around 2012 through 2015, I went back to get my master's in psychology. Um, I, I did that through the Harvard Extension School, so I went back there for a year and then wrote my master's thesis from home back here and uh, learned a lot around uh, adult development and leadership development and have been using that work with, with some college programs and some college coaches and some executive teams. Um, I've started bringing that more into my own, just my own practice as as a coach and leader of a business with, mm-hmm. with our LXTC lacrosse down here. We do camps, clinics, and teams throughout the year. We have Denver Elite Field teams, Denver Elite Box teams. Uh, we do Goalie Evolution Academy mm-hmm. and a lot of the uh, DU camps and clinics. But really for me now, uh, I just love working with um, – I really love working with youth and high school players at this mm-hmm. point, just because mm-hmm. they're such sponges. Like they just, they just want to, they want to learn everything about the game, but also they're, they're completely open to, to learning from you about things like uh, integrity and discipline mm-hmm. and communication. And so I'm really using my own um, coaching practice to uh, help support young athletes to, to learn the lessons that they can from, from the game itself. You know, I, I, I just learned so many valuable lessons from playing the game of lacrosse um, that the game, it, it, if you really dedicate yourself to the game and, and you put a lot of effort in, into it, the game will give a lot back to you. And, and so I just try to support, support the youth and high school players uh, in, in that process because I, I'm grateful for everything uh, that I learned from the game. It's, it's great that you're able to give back and you know continue to grow the game. Um, that kind of wraps up our main questions, Trevor. We're going to take a quick break, hear a word from our sponsors, and then we'll dive into our 5-5 five and five segment. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Pro Lacrosse Talk podcast. Today I want to talk to you about our sponsor, Anchor. We've been using Anchor for the Pro Lacrosse Talk podcast since the very start. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place, and better yet, it's free. They allow you to easily record and edit your podcast, and once it's published, they send it out to all the major networks such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and many more. They also connect you with advertisers so you can start making money from your podcast right away. So if you're thinking about starting a podcast today, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Today I also want to talk to you about our affiliate Parkside Cards. Parkside Cards is your go-to source for Major League Lacrosse trading cards. They have a variety of packs on their website, including a box set that comes with four tickets to an MLL game, and a Lyle Thompson signature pack that comes with a limited edition signed Lyle Thompson card. The best part is we've teamed up with Parkside Cards to provide you with a special discount. Simply visit parksidecards.com and use the code PLT to save 20% on your order today. All right, so welcome back. Now let's uh, dive into our five and five segment. So I'll ask uh, five lacrosse questions, and then Adam will follow up with five off the field questions, more about you know what you do outside of lacrosse. Uh, but the first one I have for you is: Did you have any pregame superstitions or routines when you played? 
Um, <laughs> it's so long ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I listened to like, I, I would have like a, a mix. <laughs> but this was back when kids, this was back when you had to make like a mix on a CD and, <laughs> and listen to it on your uh, your Walkman or whatever it was called, um, yeah. your Discman. Um, so I listened to the same music before every game. I would I would do visualization before my, every game. So I would um, like picture myself playing. So picture myself making saves and then also uh, picture myself um, in third person, like if I was watching like a highlight, highlight reel of myself. So those are some visualization practices that I would do. I, I also yeah. had this weird superstition where I, I was a huge Patrick Waugh fan when he played okay. for the Avalanche. Mm-hmm. And um, I would watch, uh, I would watch his last game the night before my game. So I had, would have parents on the road. This was back in the time of VCRs <laughs> bringing me uh <laughs> VH, VHS tapes with Patrick Waugh to watch him play the night before games. So those were some of my superstitions. I tried to just, just keep things the same every time, eat the same thing, yeah. do, go through the same routine, and so that I felt very consistent uh, in my approach to games every time. That's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, it's funny uh bring up Patrick Waugh. I, uh, I would watch Dominic Kosick. Uh, video before all my games. So yeah, I, I'm when it comes to hockey goalies, I did kind of the same thing. Yeah, there was something fun about hockey goalies because yeah. they got to make so many saves throughout the game that it would get you fired up about getting hit with balls. Absolutely. You goaltenders are a different breed for sure. <laughs> yes, I yes we are. <laughs> uh, number two, uh, what was your favorite venue to play at? I mean, I, I look back to to my na- my national championship, my my senior year final four yeah. at, at Rutgers, the Rutgers football stadium is just such a of a huge memory in my life that that all I, I love I mean the stadium itself was beautiful the grass field was beautiful so that that was probably one of my favorites um, and then it was always special for me um, when I got to play on Homewood um, because I when my dad was you know when I was growing up and my dad was coaching at Hopkins Homewood such a, a mecca for college lacrosse that you know playing there and um, making saves so you didn't have to hear the, the JHU band play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was a fun place for me to play as well. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, I, my dad went to the Naval Academy, so I attended many Navy Hopkins games. And uh, whenever that bl- band starts playing, if you're on the, the opposing side, it's the most irritating thing ever, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> especially if they're yeah. up by a lot. <laughs> uh, number three, what was the toughest shot? Uh, or who had the toughest shot that you faced during your career? I think Jesse Hubbard was the best shooter I ever okay. faced. Um, the the amount of velocity and also like his accuracy combined was, was just so so incredible. I mean, you would you would look back. I, I would look back after a shot from him, and it would just be like stuck right, right in that corner. <laughs> um, and I had to face him. When I was a you know freshman at practice and then in, in the pros, but uh, Jesse could could really bring it. But there were, you know, there were so many guys like like Gary Gate had such a such an interesting release and and his accuracy was was incredible. And then I also think back to guys like AJ Hogan who had just such a quick release on the run. Um, but you know there were there were a lot of great shooters. But I would say Jesse Hubbard was the best shooter I ever faced. Awesome. And then number four, who's a teammate that you kind of leaned on as a mentor throughout your career? Hmm, that's a great question. Uh, uh, Josh Josh Sims was always a really good friend of mine um, when I when I was at Princeton. Um, we we were always really and uh, still to this day are, are close. Um, uh, the, the, those guys, the, those seniors at Princeton, John Hess, Chris Massey, Jesse Hubbard, I, I looked up looked up to a lot. Um, and when I when I was really young, you know, um, guys like Scott Batchgalupo and and Quint mm-hmm. Kessenich and um, and Larry Quinn were my heroes. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, the, uh, it, it's really hard for me to, um, but, you know, one of the guys that had a huge impact on me as a kid was a guy named uh, Chris Colbeck, and Chris played at Loyola. 
and he uh, was an assistant coach for my dad for a year and then went on to be an assistant at Virginia. Um, and I really look, looked up to, to Chris a lot. He, he, was a, he was a great guy. He's not involved in the game anymore, but um, he was an awesome guy. And, and um, I, I really learned a lot from him as a, as a young uh, – I think I was kind of my teenage years. So those would be some of the guys I would mention. That's awesome. Uh, now I know Josh Sims too. I, I always his name always comes up. I got to speak to him last. I think it was about a year ago when the PLL was ramping up. You know, I think you know Josh was kind of an unsung hero. I, I don't think he's with the the league anymore. But um, you know, when he was there, uh, I think you know it was often overlooked. You know how much he meant to the PLL in its first year as well. Yeah, he he's moved on to do uh, other things now, but um, mm-hmm. I think he he really. Uh, he really worked hard that first year and, and did, did a great job for them and uh, helped helped get that helped get that lead going. So uh, he, he's a he's a hard worker and you know Josh is one of the most un, underrated I think lacrosse players of of all time. I mean he was just a tremendous midfielder and and the the, the reason I think he was underrated was because he was so unselfish on, on the field. He just did all the little things: get ground balls. Uh, get second assists and uh, he could shoot as well as anyone too but um, he was kind of understated on the, on the field which made him I think underrated over the course of his career but I think he's one of the best midfielders of all time. No, absolutely and he had you know both uh, a solid pro career uh, in the MLL and then in the NLL as well too you know it's, which is it's often not not as easy as people think to to do excel in both. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, they, he, he had some really cool, fun years to watch. Him and Jay Jalbert yeah. and um, Jamie Hanford all on the Colorado Mammoth when when Gary Gay was still playing, and they were they were a fun box team to watch uh, back in the early 2000s. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my final question for the lacrosse ones is: uh, What was one of your favorite uniforms from the you know aesthetic point of view? You know, what was kind of I guess the coolest <laughs> uniform you got to wear? You know, more of a fun question here. Uh, on that I got to wear or, or anybody? I guess it could be anybody too, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I would say my my favorite uniform to wear was my, my senior Princeton year when we wore uh, our black jerseys and orange shorts. And it was something I think I think Ryan Mollett came, came up with it. And Coach T didn't, didn't like it at first. But I think we won like a couple of games, and so he like he likes when you win games in it. So he let us keep wearing it throughout the mm-hmm. season. And then I, I always loved um, th- that same year. I always loved those Syracuse uniforms. It was like even though um, even though Syracuse and and we were we were such rivals, we, we always loved those guys at Syracuse, yeah. and they were good guys. And uh, their their uniforms were sick. Those like navy sh- Nike shorts and the white yeah. the white jerseys with the porthole mesh. Those were uh, those were classics. Yeah, no, and the porthole mesh is kind of making a comeback now. Uh, you know, I know Towson was one of the ones really rocking it, and a lot of teams now are adding them. Even my Division three uh, alma mater uh, started wearing them too. So I think they're making a comeback. <laughs> they make sense. I mean, <laughs> they're light. They're uh... They're breathable, so I don't yeah. know. If, I don't quite know why we got away from them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, with that though, uh, Adam, why don't you take away the off the field questions? Yep, sounds good. Uh, so we usually ask favorite class from undergrad, but since you're more recently uh, did, finished your master's program, what was your favorite course uh, while you were at Harvard? I learned so much. There's a professor at, at, at the reason I went there was to learn from this professor Robert Keegan, who uh, who who taught, taught adult development, the class on adult development. So I, I learned a lot from from that class and just okay. the lens that it gave me uh, around um, how we can kind of still still um, develop and grow as as adults in the way we see the world and view the world is very interesting to me. So I, I think that one is probably the one that had the most, most impact on me. Although I should say I really loved learning from – this professor Shelley Carson, and she she taught a, a class called the Creative Brain, and um, I wrote a I wrote a paper on um, on Phil Jackson in that class and how creativity and, and leadership are connected. So I also, I also enjoyed that one as well. That's awesome. No, I uh, I uh, went down a wormhole. I found your thesis and and that uh, uh, 
Phil Jackson uh, article you wrote. Those were pretty good. So those were oh, awesome. Yeah, those were great. I enjoy. I enjoy like the 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 psychological side of it too, and and like the the like mindset, the Carol Dweck books, and, and uh, that kind of stuff. I think, in particularly for goalies, it's obviously uh, it's all psycho psychological. So it's definitely something I enjoyed reading for sure. Yeah, my 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 thesis at Princeton was on um, playing in the zone, the okay. psychological aspect of peak performance in sports, just because I was so interested in trying to get my myself in the zone at the time. Yeah. So yeah, the, the 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 psychological connections in sports are are, are definitely strong. Yeah, I, I literally it's sitting on my desk right now. It's called In the Zone. It's by Mike Murphy. It's an older book, but uh, I, I read that a long time ago. So that's a good one for sure. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so number two, what are some hobbies or activities you, you enjoy uh, that are not involving lacrosse? Um, well, I, I live up in the hills of Lyons, Colorado, so mm -hmm. um, I've got a, a archery target set up and I love, I love bow hunting and hunting throughout the fall. So I'm kind of starting to get myself prepared, prepared for that. Um, Pretty much that that's my kind of recreational activity. A lot of the times during this year, I'm getting geared up to, to be on a lacrosse field for sure. the entire summer, and hopefully we get, we get back out there soon. But, um, yeah, I just uh, I, I stay active in the outdoors. My, my wife and I hike, and we just like we like being outside a lot. So those are those are my main activities when I'm not when I'm not coaching. Um, number three, what's your favorite meal and do you prefer to dine out, take out, or cook at home? My favorite meal, uh, my, my, my wife's such a great cook. Um, she, my, my favorite meal is like her desserts, but she has to, I have to tell her to stop making them because <laughs> the, the, uh, the last time I went to the doctor, I'm like, typically around like 190 and I went into the doctor and stepped on the scale it was like 210 and I was like uh honey we get, we gotta stop making so many desserts <laughs> so uh no I, I'm a big um I love um I love like pot pasta and, mm -hmm. and pizza but uh yeah she she, she makes a great uh, pasta and meat sauce Usually, like my like, if I get have like ground elk or something like that, mm -hmm. that's 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 one of my favorites. Nice, awesome. Um, and then uh, you talked. Hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to get on the field and, and and coach this summer with everything. But with everyone being kind of cooped up inside, we're we're looking for some recommendations in a couple areas. So number four, what's uh what's some good uh, shows or documentaries or or movies you're watching right now that you would suggest? <laughs> Oh boy, I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to admit to some of these after I've watched the, the whole thing. Um, uh, what what have we been watching lately? You know, what's what what's something? <laughs> I mean, everyone's like everyone's watching. Everyone watched the, the train wreck. That is Tiger King. So yeah, like, it's absolutely. like for me to recommend. I don't. I don't even want to recommend that one. But if you want to watch it. <laughs> If you want to watch a train wreck, go watch yeah, Tiger absolutely. King. Um, we just, uh, I'm like, we, we love, uh, like, the, the, it, it's so, it's so, like, cliche, but we love The Office. Like, if we can't go find that. something, we'll just watch The Office. And then um, we started watching uh, Shit's Creek, but I, I don't find myself love, loving that one. So. Okay. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm looking for suggestions more than I should be giving them right now. There we go. <laughs> um, and then number five, kind of along the same lines, but uh, from a reading standpoint, any books uh, you'd recommend currently that you've read or yeah, maybe that's what I was going to say. I'm a better I'm a better reader, so mm -hmm. um, I'm reading a really great one that the lacrosse world would enjoy. I gotta I just started it. Or I'm about halfway through it. Mm -hmm. It's called the the Arenda. It's a novel by Joseph Boyden, okay. and it's uh, about uh, it's a um, it's about like a, a French missionary being up um, around the Huron and the Iroquois. And there's actually a chapter when they when they're um, uh, playing lacrosse in the book. Um, uh -huh. So it's a pretty it's 
it, it's a pretty um, there's some there's some scenes that are fairly brutal in the book, so I wouldn't recommend it for young people. But it's mm -hmm. uh, it it is a it is a really great book, so I would recommend that one. Awesome. No, that's great. Uh, I'll have to check that one out. Is it historical fiction then, kind of, or? Yeah, yeah. It's um, from what I gather, it's it's fairly um, accurate. Although, um, yeah, I, I would say from from what I've researched, people are saying it's a fairly accurate de depiction of the the time. Huh. Although, I'm sure there's some some biases in it, but yeah. it, it's a it's an enjoyable book to read, and I was surprised to see uh, to. I think the the chapter itself is called the the creator's game, and um, yeah, it's a it's a it's cool seeing it in a, a fictionalized version of what that what the game could have looked like and felt like back then. So I was yeah, no. I was surprised to come across that uh, just randomly in this book. Yeah, that's cool. Definitely have to check that one out. Um, that wraps up our five and five. Our final question for you, Trevor. We like to ask everybody is uh, what is some advice that you have for a young player looking to one day play lacrosse professionally. First, first, I would say, don't try not to look too far down the road. You know, really, really enjoy the process of getting against the wall every day and um, just le learning the game and, and enjoy and enjoying the game itself and, and learning learning from the game. Um, because that, you know, when I, when I look back on my career, we talked a lot about championships today and stuff like that, which is which is fun to 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 recall but at the end of the day my, my greatest memories are like all the days that I was put in against the wall or um you know the 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 hard work that we put in together as a team um to lead up to those championships so I, I feel like there, we we get so caught up and with like club teams and like recruiting of like looking down the road for kids mm -hmm. when I mean, there, there, there's such great experiences to be had, you know, right now, where, wherever you are, whether you're in fourth grade or eighth grade or you're playing high school lacrosse. And look, you know, look what's happening now. I, I say to all my players, you know, my career came to an end after 12 concussions. Mm -hmm. And I say to my players all the time, your your next game or your next practice is, is not inevitable. Like your your ability to enjoy the game today is what really matters. What really matters most. So, you know, hopefully, we move through this time and we're able to get back on the fields uh, relatively relatively soon. And mm -hmm. hopefully, players, young players, don't take it for granted. Just be out there, you know, today rather than worrying about um, playing college or playing professionally. And then, if that, you know, if you put in the work, then then that that may work out. But but enjoy the game. Uh, while you have the opportunity to play is what, what I would say. I think that's some great advice, you know, for um, some young lacrosse players that, you know, want to take their game to the next level. But, you know, it's important to, like you said, focus on the moment and take it step by step. So we appreciate that advice. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, Trevor. Uh, where can people find you on social media? Um, I, I'm only on Twitter. So I'm um, at Trevor underscore Tierney. And also... Um, Ryan LaPlante runs our um, Goalie Evolution Academy mm -hmm. uh, Instagram. So if you guys want to see some of the stuff we're doing with goalies, uh, we're, we're at, I believe, Goalie Evolution Academy. And then um, all of our, our lacrosse programming is up at lxtclacrosse.com. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Trevor, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time, and uh, you know we appreciate you uh, jumping on the pod today. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Today, I also want to talk to you about Design Tree. On our Design Tree store, we have several t-shirt designs like the Pro Lacrosse Talk tee I'm wearing today, our Blast Lacrosse shirt, Cross's Medicine shirt, and many more designs on the way. Design Tree is also home to hundreds of other t-shirt designs in the realm of sports and pop culture. To help support the podcast, please consider checking out our Design Tree store at dsgntree.com backslash pro-lacrosse-talk and grab a shirt today.